Happy New Year. Indeed, it is a Happy New Year in many ways. So um, we have not been on for a while, and uh, we had big plans <laughs> to get a lot of like um, stop laughing. What are you laughing? About? Upfront work done on the Potscast, yeah. including uh, changing our hardware setup, getting it all a lot of stuff changed. And doing a lot of like writing and outlining and prep for topics, right? And um, uh, <laughs> yeah, not so much. Yeah, I did get a lot of stuff like technical stuff going along behind the scenes. So like, so it's not a total bust, but yeah, this is you know at least. But I am slightly embarrassed, you know. Yeah, like, not not idea. getting more writing done. Yeah, it's really kind of sad. yeah. I'm not but, in a good position to. I'm never. I haven't been in a good position to do writing for like 15, 20 years. <laughs> it's just sort of, just sort of called your life. Uh, yeah, it really right. is. Yeah, and people keep like, "Oh, could you write for us?" I'm like, "Oh, I'd I like to," you know, whatever. I can sit down and write at on a laptop at our kitchen table, and I do sometimes. But the only and I can kind of tune out the normal sounds of our household, six young children. <laughs> Yes. But the only way I can do that even for an hour is because you're running interference. Yes. Right. Right. So, you know, that's really the only way I could do it is if you run interference. If, if I run interference. But as far as the baby goes, sometimes there's no substitute. <laughs> so, there, there is that. There's, there's that. no, I mean, I can, I can play with her for a while, but if she gets really... Uh, upset or hungry you can't i can't uh substitute for mommy no not, you can't nobody can although you know what she's she's going to be a year old she in, is in like three days yeah this is this is actually very exciting so our our little girl uh who had a, a serious congenital heart defect yep and had to have open heart surgery it's facing down her first birthday here is and and she's really doing well Yes, she is. She's uh, she's cruising, cruising, crawling, babbling, babbling, um, um, giggling, and uh, very social. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, and, and social in the way where she has personal relationships and there's a wary of strangers. Yeah, has to get to know you first. So, um, but no, it's it's really it's really encouraging to see really how well she's done. Mm -hmm. um, we were obviously very concerned about her. <laughs> yeah, I was just reflecting with Veronica today that uh, a year ago today, yeah, 52 Sundays ago, yeah, we drove down to St. Francis for me to give a talk, and I was hugely pregnant with Eleanor. Yeah. We picked up Alice at the uh, train station in Flint on the way home. Oh, yeah, I remember that. And then, like, the next day I went to see uh, Dr. Fleming, and he's like, I think we have to admit you. Yeah. Yeah. So and so she she was born on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was that was a year ago today. You, he, so yeah, um, he had to admit you because she wasn't growing sufficiently. Yeah, she didn't yeah. seem to be continuing to continuing to grow to grow the way she was supposed to in the mm -hmm. last trimester, and she was small. She was tiny. Yeah, not you know, two months premature, tiny, but. Small. Quite small, quite she, small. like yeah. in what was the percentile? Like, I, I'm not. Was she even on the charts as, as a like first, the first, or the first or second percentile? Yeah. She weighed four pounds, five ounces. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it it was. Uh, she was barely big enough for them to allow us uh, to take her home. Yeah, but you know, she was uh, gaining, maintaining weight. She was. Yeah, she was doing well in some ways right out right out of the gate. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we're very grateful for that. So we had a we it's uh we had a low key Christmas. The best kind. Which was nice because we had kind of a, a big uh boisterous um, Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving with uh, I guess for a week. Like, guess, uh, yeah. yeah, guess coming and going for like a week. Yeah. And uh that was very nice. Thanksgiving was great. But we were ready for a little bit of a lower a key quiet, yeah, holiday yeah. for Christmas, and got one. And, we got one. and it was, it was beautiful. Uh, and uh, we don't do a lot of gifts. No, we don't. It's uh, some people find that offensive, but it, it's um, we we don't even do like the four things. What's that four things called? It's like something to read, something to wear. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. I, we, we don't even do that. We we. Um, 
like have a stocking yeah we, we do saint nicholas day we celebrate the saint feast days you know yeah we we have really and we actually uh as the kids get older and and we go along in our marriage here we've continue to de-emphasize christmas like more every year yeah i mean de- and de-emphasize like the, the sort of the, secular, gif- the, the secular gifting commercial yeah, the, yeah the gifting and the 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 thing, the shopping, the shopping and the and obsessing and about new toys and all that, or and even like obsessing about your home, right? That people so, like get yeah, that kind of oh, but we've got to get the right stockings hung by the chimney with care. So actually, we spent more uh, on some nice meals over yeah, Christmas. We had some great meals, yeah, than we did on gifts. Mm-hmm. So. And maybe the kids will hate us for that and want to <laughs> therapy and reparations. But reparations. Um, hard to say. But I think when we do it with them, when we actually said this, you know, our Christmas experience is more going to be about the fact that dad's home for a week and we're going to chill out we and have we're going to hang out together and do stuff together. We're going to cook some great meals together. I, the one thing we got them. That they actually yeah. got like on New Year's or around New Year's. Yeah. Which we got them a Lego set to build together. That was actually, yeah, that was f- like uh, on New Year's. Right. And so they spent New Year's Day so by you, the fire building Legos. I did buy them a big Lego set that t- Target had marked way down. One set for all of them. Yeah. For the and that's actually kind of a deliberate strategy too, because I want to see them work on their interactions, right. you know, and it's not easy for kids of six different ages to do anything together, to work really. together on a single project right but it really sort of forces them to to you know strategize for that and like okay what can we give the four-year-old to do that he's not just gonna scream and throw all the legos all the on the legos floor everywhere. yeah and, yeah and let's keep the one-year-old happy and not eating the legos you know <laughs> yeah yeah i'm um, just gonna talk to her and chat with her and play with her bring her back to mom yeah etc so uh yeah good holiday it was it really was and uh now i'm back at work and it's uh feels like a slog i have to tell you yeah it's it's the dark time of the year it's we've had weird weather snow well, it's been very weird like warm cold between, warm like, cold and like bitterly cold yeah and then when it's warm again now i know for folks that aren't in the area yeah um warm for us after minus five degrees is like 30 yeah and i right. seriously i didn't even wear a coat today yesterday it was in the it was in the low 40s yeah and that does not prompt me to wear a coat no honestly no. after it's been 10 degrees or right even, you know, it, it feels like you could have shorts on yeah for I'm god's yeah. sake it really I mean, does. yeah so we uh we, we did get out for a walk you want to talk about the walk of the week yeah let's talk about the walk of the week so this is a walk we've done before this is marshview meadows but it's marvelous in the snow I, has, has it been snow covered before? I, I think I remember it was dusting once. But yeah, it's been like six weeks it's been since a long we've time been since out. Had a good walk. Yeah, yeah it's been since very we got cold a, for a while. Yeah. yeah, the the and then like the last one we did was so bitter cold that it was pretty cut short, and the kids were yeah. really it was unhappy. Miserable and you know, kind of angry. Yeah. Um, but this was really lovely, and even even like you know little four-year-old guy who's a bit capricious in, in ways that four-year-olds are um he seemed to have a good time and went down for a great nap afterwards yeah but with him it, yes the mood he was in kind of exhausted and cranky it was all we could do to get a one-hour walk in one hour walk in. and that's for me physically that's just not enough oh it's barely scratching the surface yeah i'm just like it just gets my legs loosened up well i think um as as many things are with children, it's less about um, fitness. <laughs> well, it's less, it's less about maybe your personal goals sure. and where you are. Like, yeah, and and we've had a difference of opinion about this before. But like, if you're playing Scrabbles, it's, you're not playing Scrabble with the kids to so win. You, to win, <laughs> I crush you with my thirty-two letter words. Yeah, that's not actually the goal here. <laughs> so, so in this sort of fitness thing you do with the kids, it's not about you know me benching all i can you know no the, or whatever the, the it is, problem it's, is it's the way things are kind of structured now where it's like, the only exercise we do I, yeah like in saginaw for a while i set my life up so that every morning before work i would go out and walk for an hour or more yeah you would take you sometimes walk like five six miles 
Yeah. 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 It and, was it were good, long. And that was really helping my physical health and my mental health. And, uh, you know. And, and I know you'd like to get back to that in some respect. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, that's not. The walks aren't going to be it. Yeah, they can't be it. No. And um, and it also can't be the only thing, right? Right. But what you can do with children is engage with them on their level, do things that they can do. But also get something, something they can get something yeah. personally. Now, the, the only thing I really regret about it is that I have difficulty with is that the process of getting six kids into the car wearing shoes, socks, some kind of appropriate things on their legs, a jacket and or gloves and, and or a hat and, 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 and or a scarf, scarf for six kids. It's at, comically on on a yeah. schedule, like right. you know, before the park closes, before, before sundown. Right. <laughs> it's just <laughs> absurd. It, it's it really. I mean, uh, you you think that you've developed patience? Oh no! Over the years with you children, but uh, you don't know. They patience. constantly are finding new ways to make you new ways to teach you to <laughs> to teach you. <laughs> You know, perhaps you're a reluctant student, but you yeah. will learn. <laughs> There's a character in Fraggle Rock, mm-hmm. played by Jim Henson. Actually, well, um, the old um, the mystic. Head? No, the old like mystic guy. He, no, no, who's that? Uh, I can't, I don't remember the character's Matt? name. No, no. Oh, I don't know who this is. Well, he visits once in a while, and people get his advice. Okay, He's yeah. this sage oh, yeah, character. Yeah, I can't remember his name. Yeah, yeah. And they're all acting so goofy at one point that he says something like, you are trying my legendary patience. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I feel kind of like that, you know. Patience. My patience is legendary, but you're finding new ways. To... <laughs> finding new boundaries. Right. Yeah. Well, But the walk was good. The walk was good. And it was beautiful. Yes. It's, I'm really impressed with this park, actually. It was yes. kind of like a little piece of trash by the by the railroad and it's been turned into a lovely lovely nature park it is a lovely nature park it's strange that you can hear the traffic so loudly from well no like it's it's like was like this little piece of trash land seriously yeah, yeah there's yeah. the train tracks there's us 12 you can still yeah. hear the traffic right there's a lot all this traffic around it right um it would be nice if it was quiet and serene. if that wasn't there but well, that, like that's this the, is what happens with an urban setting like that. right well and that's that's what's always been so uh, unusual to me about County Farm mm-hmm. is County Farm is really in the heart of an urban area, and once you go into the woods there, yeah, the traffic fades away. It it's fades just, away. It's incredibly well designed. It f- it does. It fades away. You switch back. You you go up into like a, up a little um, a little hill or hill a hill there. around a corner, and then it's the traffic's faint. gone. Yeah, right, it's, it's very faint. Yeah. and I think they try to do some of that at this yeah. park because you go way down. Right, and that that actually that has another function too. The parking lot is kind of on an exposed little hill, right? And it's very windy there, and, and very s- unpleasantly so. Yeah, and so uh, you may be like freezing because of the wind, freezing, and, and then you start on the trail, and the trail drops down like below ground level, right, like like I want to say ten feet. Yeah, it's ten feet lower. It could easily. be. Yeah, and so you're immediately. As soon as you get into the walk, into you're the walk, cut you're off from the, the wind. Out of the wind, and yeah. that's that's very nice. But, but yeah, I'm not sure why the traffic noise travels. It, well, it's also because the leaves are down. Oh, that's, that's true. So, it's true. We've only experienced this park in yeah. fall and winter. So it'll be. I think that'll change a bit in the spring, spring and summer. Anyway, so so that was our walk. We so yes, we've been we we haven't been walking yeah. and are back to it some. Which I'm very grateful for. Well, we did have that one walk in Ipsy, and that wasn't six weeks ago. But I, like, I think we've missed many weeks. We've missed many weeks. Yeah, it just hasn't come together for us. Yeah. Um, so what else has been going on over the holidays and since we were last uh, we're last speaking? What oh. jumps into your head here that we've done? Oh gosh, I, I always feel like I haven't done anything. <laughs> but. Um, I've been reading this book uh, called Design Your Design It Yourself Clothes by Cal Patch. Mm. And um, she's a clothing designer, wrote this book. It's, uh, I think I bought it off of Google Play. Mm-hmm. Or some, is that what it's called? Yeah, and it's, it's an e-book. It's an e-book, yeah. I was hoping to get 
um, the printed copy. Printed copy. I'm not sure. I can't. I, I can't tell. <laughs> some some authors now release books that have there's no printed representation available. That's so weird. It, <laughs> it is weird because I know, I know I'm I've been thinking about self publishing some of my collections of essays, mm -hmm. and I could do that as an ebook, but I, I really don't want to you want a physical thing i want a bound book yeah, yeah. yeah. maybe, maybe yeah. nobody cares about that but old people like me but us yeah yeah or not, not maybe chicken either maybe i just need to make it available in multiple versions Something so like that. i think if you're doing a self-publishing thing you can, it can it's basically print on demand anyway so right. you know, right. it, it can you, be. Yeah, you don't have to have it like on the shelf somewhere. The difficulty is that, uh, it's like, you can generate a basic book layout from a single file mm -hmm. that, like, you know, the contents there. Right. But I'm a big fan of print as a art form. <laughs> you know. Yeah. No, I agree. And I print agree. layout as, like a very careful way to structure the contents of each page with typographic, you know, hyphens and... Well, it's it's actually an interaction with yeah, the reader. With he the headings that I want and the spacing and font and layout of every page the way I want it. Right. And um, I haven't found an uh, uh, ideal workflow for that yet. Yeah. There are workflows, but I don't really want to format the the thing three different times. Yeah, that could be a pain. I did do some writing between Christmas and New Year's. Yeah? So I... I oh, yeah, yeah, that's right. You had yeah. your, your little sprint. I sat at the kitchen table and worked for several days, pretty much several days, mm -hmm. on an essay, uh, which may wind up appearing in print later in the year. And yeah, we'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. I'm talking to the guy that edits a, a, a magazine. Right. Um, it's about uh, the work of Philip K. Dick. So, hmm. big surprise, Paul's talking about Phil Dick again. Shocking. Yeah. In particular, the book Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which became was adapted into the movie Blade yeah. Runner. Mm -hmm. And I read this book when I was like 15 or 16. Mm -hmm. And this book, a uh, flawed, very, very odd novel yeah can, it's really peculiar continues to just absolutely fascinate me mm -hmm. 30 <laughs> 30 odd years later more than 30, 30 years, years after yeah, yeah. yeah. and I, I continue i think it continues to fascinate a lot of people because mm -hmm. like another blade runner movie came out mm -hmm. recently yeah and, like a sequel basically yeah and it's part of what the essay is about is the vast differences between the movie version of Dick's world as expressed in the novel yeah. and the novel itself. Right. And, um, Spoilers, yeah. there's big differences. There are big differences. So that may go into, you may see that... Uh, in print sometime. In print, and if it's not going to be printed in this uh, this magazine, mm -hmm. I'll put it online. <laughs> it's Seems not true. like I'm going to get paid for it. So, so it's all good. Yeah. yeah, so this book I've been reading is part of... Um, so I think I mentioned that Joshua is hatching a plan to try and sell world something. domination, world domination, <laughs> Joshua, and um, and sort of in that vein, I've got a lot of these sort of make it yourself things. Well, he's he's thinking about a co-op, right? Like a, yeah, he's thinking about workers, a Mondragon type workers cooperative of right. uh, textile, textile you know, artisanal textiles. Yes, so I'm I'm actually really looking forward to this website. Um, cool, but uh, so this is my ongoing effort to support him in that. And also to to support myself, and uh, I made my first and only successful garment. Because you know, I I've quilted it for a long time and enjoy sewing a lot, mm -hmm. but um, I haven't sewn much since really sewn since Isaac was little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, like t again, like twenty years ago. Yeah. But the um, thing I did with Veronica that was a lot of fun is we took a sewing class while I was pregnant with Eleanor last winter. Mm -hmm. And I made these pants, and I feel like a superhero when I wear, I wear these pants. <laughs> really, it's my first successful Superhero. sewing project. I just love these pants. <laughs> and they, they um, 
wore out in the thighs. And chubby girls, you know, uh, like you get the the, the, the chub rub, <laughs> the thigh, thigh rub. Let's we'll start a fire. When it, yeah, yeah, start a fire when you start walking. But the uh, and like I'm just gonna patch them because these are the best pants I've ever owned, right? Um, That's and cool. There's this sort of like real something tangible in a way I can't. You can't get it from other clothes. You get off. You get it from the store. I'm kind of imagining thing. the scene in The Incredibles. Where the uh, superhero costume designer is demonstrating yes. the new outfit, you know, lighting them on, you know, shooting flamethrowers and missiles at the <laughs> clothes. What baby's going to be doing? <laughs> I sure I don't know, no. darling. <laughs> <laughs> exactly like that, actually. But um, <clears throat> so I'm interested in making more clothes that I love as much as I love those pants. Because mm-hmm. I keep I keep taking them out to wear before I repair them again, just damaging them more because I love yeah, them so much. Yeah. Uh, so this is me looking into and figuring out how to make patterns and um, develop actually a piece of clothing. And, cool. And maybe shape patterns more to meet my interests because mm-hmm. there's this ongoing problem with pockets and women's clothing. <laughs> um, so you should probably <laughs> the the problem is what. There are none. They don't have them. <laughs> they don't have them. So Men figure, what would they carry? They they're can't. women. They're women. <laughs> so, um, it's not like they're going to have any money or anything. <laughs> not if we have anything to say about it. But that, so that details like that, that are important to me in an item of clothing, I'm, I want to try and um, engineer those into some of the things that don't have pockets in them, add them. Etc. Mm-hmm. Um, also, I always like skirts to be longer than people ever make skirts. Right. right. Yada yada yada. Modesty I, didn't that go out with the Amish? And, one, yeah. <laughs> They're weird. Hundreds of years. I don't know. So that's my big reading recently. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, other than that, I, you know, I nurse kids and. No, there is there is something we've been doing. We've been we've been doing. Every, oh, that's right. We've been doing that. Every weekend for three consecutive weekends now. Yeah. Uh, we've been going to meet up with people in the, various local socialists. organizations. Well, first the first I'll thing there was more than that. Yeah. The first thing was this uh, Ypsilanti area group. In um, an unconference. Yeah, an unconference. So, which is really was really um, the open space technology. Mark Maynard is a, a blogger, who, local guy, a local blogger uh, who, you know, connects with various sort of uh, local mm-hmm. arts and culture folks and political folks, and seems to you know connect with a lot of people. Mm-hmm. And he organized a conference where he invited people to come and brainstorm about the future of Ipsy and what kind of organizing activities they'd like to see. Yeah, it was. I thought it was mostly pretty good. I found the shortness of it extremely frustrating. Yeah. Because, you know, as soon as you got, as soon as I found, I don't know about your sessions, but as soon as we figured out what we were talking, the session, what we were talking about, the session was over. The place is the Riverside? Riverside Arts Center. Arts Center, downtown Ipsy. And there were like four sessions going on at once. Yeah. I think six. Six? Okay. There were like six sessions simultaneously. Yeah. And then three. So you, you had to choose like what group you wanted right. to. Choose one of six sessions in three blocks. Yeah. And then uh, I was there in part to basically throw out the podcast idea and uh, get on some email lists and chat with people and look for people who might want to contribute. Collaborate. Collaborate in some way. Mm-hmm. And that hasn't. I I haven't seen any follow up. Um, yeah, I haven't seen a lot of follow up from that. So I, I've got to have to look and see. He was going to make Google Docs and email right. lists and stuff. And um, I think there's like two people that I need to email from that. Yeah. yeah, but so it was interesting. But I didn't don't know that it was hugely effective as far as met some great contacts, you know. Yeah. Or like kindred spirits who really want to work together. But yeah. we'll see. Something more might come of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we've also been uh, hanging out with socialists. Hanging out with socialists. So, so socialists. So, so I have. Why do they call it socializing with socialists? Because <laughs> that would be irritating. All right, I'm just saying. You know, um, I've been curious for a while about what's the what is the actual uh, DSA chapter. 
or what, chapters what, who, yeah, or groups, Demo- right. DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, right. around here, what are they doing? What, what's their ideology? What's their praxis? Yeah. Um, and so f- we've been going to their, I, I hadn't, I was going to go before Christmas to their monthly meeting. Right. It's it's six thirty on on Thursday, like Thursday evenings, yeah. and I, usually I'm barely out of work by then. Yeah, it's a terrible time. And trying to get downtown yeah. on a school night, you know, the traffic and parking and all. I'm just I'm not enthusiastic about it. I should go, um, but instead we've been going to these Sunday like open ended coffee hangouts, right? Which they do at um, they've been I guess alternating yeah. between. Ypsilanti and Ann Arbor. Yeah. Right. And um, strangely enough, both are about the same distance from our house. Yeah. Even though we live in an Ypsilanti mailing address. Right. And so um, we've met a few folks and hung out and chat. Yeah. And today's chat I thought was especially productive because we actually did exchange uh, email and phone with a, a couple guys. Yeah. And, they, were, uh, they seemed fun. Yeah. We, the, we had a long we stayed really late after the rest of the folks had left. Right. And it was just like, these were like the, the uber nerds the uber nerd who wanted nerd. to talk Marx and Marx e- theory, uh, economic, yeah, economic theory. theory. And like, right. so, and we were down for that because it also turned into a debate about free will. Free will and the meaning of life. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was, it was frustrating, fun. It and, was delightful. frustrating and delightful, which is, you know, yeah. Anyway, so we met some folks. So we may be having folks on the podcast via Skype or in the studio. So uh, that's the plan. We'll see how that goes. But that's been promising. It seemed it seemed a little unpromising. People are very friendly, but you realize, you know, you're just like you're not really clicking with them. You know, yeah, polite, friendly. Yeah. yeah so, but uh, we'll see. Looking for people in the area who are both. Um, kind of kindred spirits and actually doing stuff. Yeah, yeah. Right. So. The, yeah, the finding both of those are, is hard. Right. Right. Um, yeah, and, and I I would like to do more. I, the, the ASP doesn't have a chapter here. Like, who, who is the ASP? The Ameri- um, American Solidarity oh, Party. Oh, American Solidarity Party. Um, so yeah. we, we don't actually have a chapter, and I'm kind of the person to organize You're the that. chapter. Yeah. Well, and there are other, there are lots of other folks in Michigan actually yeah but, but it's a big state it's a big state and i don't know that anyone's organized into a chapter uh-huh. like a formal chapter with meetings and stuff here um so i'd like to do more of that but i also don't want to burn myself out yeah well it it has to be stuff we can fit into our schedule and right. work around kids you know yeah yeah it's one of those things so and you know, so we can't we can't really be going to march and get ourselves arrested and chaining ourselves to things and all that but which i i'm to some extent I'm dubious about the effectiveness of that to some extent i think you're i think you're kind of done with that phase of your well, not, activism not, well i don't know if it's like a, i don't want to call it a phase exactly right okay um but i just wonder like i i i certainly don't dismiss or disparage like the uh, plowshares actions, mm-hmm. I, I think those are valuable. And I think people should do more of those. Yeah, I, I think crossing the line, the School of Americas, is valuable, right? Yeah. Um, some of these things that I think are, that don't have sort of a, at least any structure that someone's communicating to me, or like you know what someone's doing something, right? Where there's, here's the goal, and the goal is to go to court. Uh, so you can enter certain things yes, in the record, yes, right? Yes. So I'm not sh- clear that that's the goal. People like all these folks that ended up getting their charges dropped for protesting at the inauguration last the Trump's year. Trump's inauguration, right? They had to go through uh, go through hell to. They really did, and I yeah. and it's not clear to me that getting arrested was their goal. No, right? No. Um, it's something that happened, and is sort of just another data point in the fascist state that we live in. Right, right. But I don't understand that that's actually was their goal, met a need, and advanced some cause and agenda. Yeah. Other than providing more data about the fascist state that we live in. <laughs> that they'll... Uh, I hope... 
that they'll I, finger yeah. bang you all wearing the same dirty glove. <laughs> right. That, that's that the state will do that to you. Right. And like not blink an eye <laughs> or be held accountable in any way. I, I actually already have that information. I don't need more of it. Right. Right. Personally. Personally, I'm <laughs> to good. To experience it firsthand. Yeah. yeah, I'm good. So I'd like to, I would certainly like to see risk taking activism and plowshares and um um direct actions yeah that advance it, a cause and a purpose it's a i think it's also a little easier to do that if you have confidence that an officer won't just kill you yes that's true too yeah that's that's true too and, and, or or even if you're confident the officer might right and I guess what I, what I'm getting at is I don't want to I don't quite want to go down this. Well, back in my day, <laughs> when we did activism; it was real. I, I don't. I'm not the, quite uh, going there. They set the dogs on us and brought out the fire hoses. But I I think people don't fully grasp the deep training that people went through to do their nonviolent activism yeah, in the civil yeah. rights movement. That yeah, you knew no, the Ro- dogs were coming and you knew the hoses were coming. Rosa Parks was not. A spontaneous no, that was not an act. act. Right, it, it was not a highly choreographed act of, um, civil highly disobedience. Co- choreographed yeah, it civil was a, it was a planned, you know, planned to s- wanted arrest. <laughs> right, it was it was all part right. of the plan. Right, and she was not just a tired seamstress or whatever the by a long shot, by a long says. shot, by a long shot. Right, um, and we can have a long conversation about. Um, how that's not fair to all the people that came before her and did have these spontaneous um, protests right? and get arrested for it. But then she instead became the poster child because she was palatable. Yes. Um, that's a different conversation. It's sure. a relevant conversation. Yeah. But I think the big issue for me is that we advance in some way in a movement by understanding what we're doing and doing it for a reason, mm-hmm. right? Rather than, I don't know, showing up um, to shout in the streets. Yeah. So one of the guys we spoke to today, I mean, I've had this issue going back and forth about how, I, I don't know, like, do I really agree with everything this group stands for and is doing? Do I want to join them? Am I a joiner? You I know? don't know. Do I want to belong to any club that would have me as a member? Probably not. <laughs> And he said, you know, he, he was saying, don't worry about this, you know, join a group. We have this tendency to think, I thought this was a great comment. Said, oh, that's we, really good, yeah. We have this tendency to think of groups in an authoritarian way, where by joining the group, you're ceding your own autonomy to some example and agreeing to do what they tell you and agreeing to follow their values or not. Right. But it can also work the opposite way and should which is yeah. not that by joining the group, you become more like them. But by joining the group, they become, become more, more like, like you. <laughs> and I, that, was, that? that was encouraging. He's, uh, he's also um, interested in promoting democracy in the Democratic Party. Whoa. Which, I don't know, that seems like... Kind of, that seems like, I don't know. That's, <laughs> that's going pretty far. It seems like a, uh, that's a lot to ask, I guess. Of, of the Democratic Party that they should be democratic, but um, you know, they, but yeah, it's something they're they're clearly not doing, and many many Democrats don't seem interested in it. I mean, yeah. just look at super delegates to begin yeah, with. That's one issue, right? Like but but he's convinced that this is a, a use, useful place to put your activism. He pointed out that um, there are like fifteen thousand. Yeah, the, the so state. there are lots of people who vote Democratic. But as far as the people who actually have membership, have membership, have you know, are active members who join committees and work on organizing for the Democratic Party, just in Michigan, just in Michigan, mm-hmm. fifteen thousand, right? And, and, and my, my guess was five thousand. That's like the number of people that would show up for a thing. Five thousand people will show up for a convention. like a statewide convention. Just yeah, looking at five grand, five thousand so, people. If you think of it that way, the idea that you and your friends joining could have measurable impact. some measurable impact by pushing for adopting resolutions and active, it starts to seem less crazy yeah just less absurd you know like yeah. yeah how could that happen i think there um and this is this is what i didn't say at the time yeah that i think is 
is relevant, but I don't think it negates what he's talking about or what he's trying to do. Because I, I think whatever it is, that just sounds contradictory. If there's something that's on you that you think would work, that you think you should do, I really want you to do that. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, I, I, I'm not a big fan of like um, the big marches about nothing yeah. or, or about something, but I, I, I'm not sure what it does, right? Yeah. Um, we are, I mean, we are aware of all the the current events and marches yeah, that yeah. have been going on. We're not going to get too deep in the weeds in any of these yeah, particular no. current event things, including the government shutdown yeah, yeah, I'm not going today. But. Um, but yeah, if there's something that you think, you know, I can do that, that would work, go do that. Go try it. Go try it. Sure. And I love that this guy is, is trying this. Yeah. He's working on this and well, is and pushing this button. His take also is you, know, you don't have to not be a DSA member. You don't have to not be. You don't have to drop these other things. You could, I mean, you could. you can be. It's. You know, it's maybe people will yell at you and people will call you out and get, you know, upset. This is a socialist <laughs> plant. Or whatever. And this is, I mentioned that, you know, I've never been uh, criticized so much politically by anyone, any group, any people. Any group at all. Until. Um, Dems in 2016. Yeah. Until I was a Democrat, you know, a, a, a person on the left who was saying no I'm not going to support Hillary Clinton. Yeah. And that just made people apoplectic, my god. Yeah, no, it was ugly. And they're still apoplectic. Yeah, it's still about ugly. you know how the small fringe of leftists are ruined responsible. everything. Yeah, they spoiled ruined everything. everything. Oh, yeah. but um I guess that's a good take off take take off for what I'm trying to say about this as a strategy. Yeah. Um I I wonder about just how entrenched um, the unacknowledged le- leaders are, right? Or the yeah. un- like the yeah. sort of like the non-public leaders, and that that's a barrier that is not really right. visible. Sure, and it's you need like three to one in the to, Democratic, to overturn that yeah. kind of leadership. And in the Democratic Party, uh, what we're finding out and hearing is that it's this army of consultants, you know, right, army right. of. Of operatives well, but the and says, yeah. but the, you know, right. said. so like you can all be there and you can all say what to do and but what the consultant said is, some you know. some of the the people who are equal are more equal, than, equal than others, others right so uh, maybe all you do is beat your head a, uh, against it but as someone who's slightly inside the tent at least maybe you find out more maybe you find out more or, or you can figure you're out in what a better the position to right. diagnose the the problem. problem well and also maybe maybe you discover what the leverage points are and where yeah. you can yeah change something in the future yeah and it's sort of this classic well i'd like to change it from within and i'm i'm not i'm just not sold on that personally no, no. um but i i don't want to discount anyone on the inside who, who's trying to do something yeah. good i guess i like to change organizations from one foot in the organization one foot <laughs> out, <laughs> outside and so people people you know various reasons having to do with tribalism and ownership and all that they don't like to feel like, like that. that's happening no they don't and, and i and, and i don't i don't want to just dismiss tribalism as like oh that's so backwards no, it's, it's it's a real thing work. it's how people work yeah um there's lots of we have lots of data on this yeah um and, and i think we should do less fighting with it and and I, honestly I, we should we need to embrace that as reality mm-hmm. and deal with it yeah but uh but yeah, but understand that that's what you're running into, and that's not going to go away. And maybe right. there's some way to, to interact and engage it. Yeah, and and that class consciousness is fleeting. Yeah, this is uh, this saying has just been hammered home for me over and over recently mm-hmm. because I keep seeing it happen uh, in other people and in my own life, where everyone just basically just defaults back to the hierarchy, even if they're like. Um, they're feeling empathy. They're feeling compassion for for a little while, for a brief moment. As soon as the the focus shifts, the settings change. We're back to our our hierarchy and our mm-hmm. self protectiveness and yeah. protecting our own status, as opposed to realizing that we have a status and a lot of people don't even have our status. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, topic. Topic. Yeah, that was all like just. <laughs> Saying hi. That was us warming up. We haven't been on the mics for a long time. Six weeks. I mean, we've kind of missed you. But it hasn't been six weeks. This was like well, okay, maybe it was six weeks. Five five or six. Was it, it was like it was middle December. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, five, six weeks. Yeah. It's, it's been, been a, while. a long time. Um 
so we've got this uh, topic we kind of want to revisit several times throughout the course of the year. We'd like to make this a theme of 2018 and, yeah. and see if we can get do s- multiple shows on it, maybe get people back to talk about the and topic. Engage in this topic. Like, yeah, and the topic is economic issues for millennials. Yeah. Like, um, there are a lot of issues. Yep. And um, a lot of nuts to be cracked wide open. So we're going we're gonna to talk today about three, briefly, uh, just, just about... Briefly, right? Yeah, we always say that. <laughs> you keep saying that. I don't think you guys know what grief means. That, that word does not mean what I think. <laughs> what do you think it means? Um, uh, um, yeah, three articles that, that touch on uh, millennial economics. Yeah, so article number one, America Ate Its Young. Yep. This is... Uh, Can you pronounce the author's name? <laughs> I'm going to try. His name is um, Omer ha- No, I can't. <laughs> um, is he a vampire? <laughs> This came from Medium. Yeah. So uh, it's Umar or Umer, H A Q U E, Hawk or Hake. I, I, maybe it's Hake. I'm not really sure. Yeah. But something I'm not like sure how to pronounce his name. Yeah. There um, it is. Uh, and the title of the article, or I should say essay, this is an essay format How America Ate Its Young, or How a Society Destroys Its Own Future. Mm hmm. And, um, He says, you know, are you being hyperbolic or whatever, right? And he's like, you know, um, in just stark terms, American youth are dying earlier than European youth, right? Yeah. I mean, five years earlier. So that's like one thing. It's a death sentence, right? Well, but, that's, that's one of his topics here, the opening that, sentence. Would you say that at the outer limits, being young in America is something like a death sentence? Right. And he says, yes, empirically, it is. So let's just empirically, get that out of the way. Empirically, it is. And it's not it, just hyperbolic. Right. But he's speaking also, um, not metaphorically, but in deeper terms. Yeah. And the quote that actually jumped at me was, death isn't just the brain shutting down, mm-hmm. a binary either or. Death, if we think about it carefully, is more the loss of human possibility, which comes in grades and stages. Mm-hmm. So you might say, I feel barely alive, or my mother's half there, or whatever you might say. We mean that. We mean that there's this loss. Yeah. Their lives aren't reaching fruition. They're diminishing. They're withering in some way. Yeah. Um, and that's really happening here. The loss of our fuller potential. So not just literally the fact that millennials are now dying, dying five younger. years earlier, and that, that trend is, is it's increasing growing. year after year. Right. But also, there's this this deeper death. When we, what we're really saying when we talk about death, the loss of potential, the loss of loss of human potential. Right. Yeah. Um, and there's like three ways we kind of like um, shut the coffin on our young young people and then just buried them all. You know, mm-hmm. buried, I just buried them in a shallow grave. Um, so the first was the wholesale deconstruction of what little retirement and pension systems America had. Mm-hmm. Uh, that began in the '70s and '80s, and that was. That's nail number one. Yep. It goes a long way towards like saying, you know, so what do you even have to look forward to as a young person? Where are you going to end up? What right. are you working for right. towards? Uh, number yeah. two, second nail in the coffin. Uh, a severe deficit of public goods, which means no real working health care, education, transport, finance, et cetera. Mm-hmm. I mean, he uses health care as an example and its cost and how it's... Um, just increasing every year and wages have remained stagnant. Right. And that's one example. And I think a lot of us are familiar with that example. But um, it gets worse because we're, it's not just health care. It's also your education. It's also your car or your transit system, or however you're getting around. Um, it, it's also your ability to finance anything. It's a whole... All the basics of life. Everything. You, you, you start to see network effects where a deficit in one area has a cascade. I mean... Your, the infrastructure of the social safety net and the social goods, the social, you know, your public services, all of them together, they fit together. They support each other. Right. So you can get a bus to go to the doctor. You can, you know, to go to your job. You can, uh, you know. Take a train. You can take a train. You can get support when you're short on money and you're unemployed, your unemployment isn't going to stop. Your uh, your food benefits aren't going to stop when you need them most, right. you know. And the sad truth is that America has never had working systems for the basics of life, and 
its leaders don't appear to be interested in building them any time in the foreseeable future. I, I would also say that was never, that was never the agenda. That was never really the agenda. The agenda that we've discussed before is under um, the New Deal. The idea was that uh, the state would provide just enough to, to prevent people revolution. from yeah from rioting from dying in the streets and rioting and right. uprising that that was and that was only ever the the uh, point um, and oh, look at me I haven't outlined number three or did I not do number three um, third nail in the coffin this one's about uh, us their their elders we failed the young so badly we'll go down in history like a dumbfounded Greek protagonist <laughs> but our greatest failure of all not just never building working systems it's not building working systems for the young because we only see them as consumers producers employers workers cogs in the machine of a broken dream we don't see them as human beings yes and um oh i think that's true that's very true that's expressed everywhere and everything that you see people referring to millennials as snowflakes and or telling them to pull themselves up by their own bootstraps and get it together and how get, you know get a job you got work to do. in my day we had to walk uphill both ways to the factory or whatever. Blah, blah, blah. you know um but it's, it's not really unless unless you're old enough to remember the great depression that's not true it's not actually true yeah yeah um my, my father died more than 10 years ago he lived through the great depression right that that generation is passing away. Yeah, and that was, uh, you know, that was the last time that there was this sort of mass uh, mass effort to just hold it together yes. and keep on keeping on. Yeah, um, and that's that's really a f- it's a fundamental problem that I come back to again and again. This failure to understand that we're talking about human beings, talking about human beings, human lives, and I really like how he focuses on the loss of potential because this right. ideology of capitalism says, well, just get a job. You know, don't be too proud. Don't be too proud to take any job. To, to take any job as if jobs were fungible. Well, as if they're fungible, as if you can just go get one. And as if you can just go get like one. Like it's on the shelf, just go pick one up. And <laughs> as if, you know, like the fact that you trained your whole life and you expected your whole life and you have skills and, and, you know, abilities that you'd like to use. People have been gaslighting you for decades and about then, how you're supposed to go do this. And but but it's uh, you should be grateful. satisfied and content and grateful to be stocking shelves. You know, at a grocery store, working yeah, to work, work in retail, be working in food service or a call center, or call center. Uh, but and not acknowledge that. Well, somewhere along the line. Including the fact that you've got you know enormous unpayable student loans, yeah. stuff got broken. Yeah, the 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 plan fell apart. The social compact fell, fell apart. apart. The whole the um, the whole of everything yeah. kind of fell apart. Um, and you should be okay with that because it's all on you. It's right. you against capitalism. Capitalism. That's Good it. Good luck. And but you know it would be wrong <laughs> to do anything collectively. Or about capitalism, and that's that's what because um, that would be immoral. That's what Sartre is getting at in his essay about elections: is collective action is is valuable. Elections are only so valuable, well, yeah. only ever so valuable, and mm-hmm. they have all these negative side effects in the way you feel like you're doing something. On well, the way they reprogram your brain to th- to f- to feel like that's your role is to be is to go to the ballot box. And that's yeah, and that's, that's your full role as a citizen. That's your full role as a as a citizen. Right. It, it completely your obligation. It just erases the public square. Yeah. Right. So um <clears throat> we've kind of I I'm going to use his last uh, phrase here. The old, close to his last phrase, the old must give life to the young, not take it from them, yeah. as we have done. A society can scarcely go on functioning for long any other way. Yeah, this is, uh, it, it's, Just it's, as a brief it, aside, it's disturbing. But This um, is why this I'm pro-life. <laughs> But just, you know. But this is what has happened. Right. When you look at everything through the lens, increasingly the lens of uh, 
cash value. Cash value, cash value this and is, economic returns this and economic is what pressures. Happens. You'll sell your own kids. You'll sell everyone else's kids. All right. For magic beans. Yeah. Which brings me to uh, the next article, uh, the 401k article. 401ks aren't magic. Yeah, this is... Um, so the, the previous one was largely... Uh, I mean, I do feel included in, in, in minor ways in this cultural shift as, right. an, as an employee and a parent and all this sort of, um, you know, our lives are a little unconventional and we're looked down on in some ways, like being irresponsible by having a large family and things like that. But, the planet. but I'm 50. I'm not a millennial and I'm a Generation X or I'm firmly in Generation X. I'm in some weird phantom generation. So I'm <laughs> discuss that. But... Um, I didn't face the same degree of economic pressure that millennials have, and I am reasonably well established in a career. You know, I had fits and starts along the way, and I've been unemployed a number of times, but that's where I am now. So I don't Mm -hmm. feel quite as like abused. I, you know, exploited. I mean, we could talk about the ways I've been exploited, exploited, but. Mm It's not the same degree. Oh know. no, no, I don't think so. I really don't think so. But this, but this next piece, four hundred one ks aren't magic. This is my life. Right now, right. it's it is equally applicable to millennials. But yeah, this is really. But it starts to the the retirement issue becomes more urgent every year. Every year that you oh work. <laughs> so I'm laughing because remember our stink bug friend. We have this the stink bug situation here in Southeast Michigan. Yes. So we come back to the. The studio after an invasive, six weeks. invasive species. And They're harmless. Dink bug on the mic. He's <laughs> crawling on your headphones right now. Just dropped onto your shoulder. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I guess he just wants to be a part of it. He you wants know? to be a part. I I have little breadboarded circuits. They've been in my office at mm-hmm. work. Um, they were in my car. Like I got in the car and I I reached uh, to put a cup in the cup holder in between the seats and there's a yeah. stink bug sitting in the cup. cup. I'm like, what the? <laughs> Wait, they're just everywhere? Just yeah, they're everything? everywhere. And then yeah. um, I went into my office. They've been fly- they have been blundering around the office. Bloom, bloom, bloom. But the day after I got back from New Year's, after New Year's, mm-hmm. uh, I went in and my coworker came over and he's like, that's a new chip on the, that little breadboarded circuit you've got there. And I'm like looking at, huh? And so I, there's these little microchips all wired together on this breadboard, and among them Is was a stink, stink bug, bug on its back with its little legs up in the air. Like I'm volunteering, plug me in, plug man. Me in. I can do it. <laughs> <laughs> they just want to be included. Yeah. Yeah, I understand. Don't we all? Don't we all? I think that's it's true. gross. They they don't bite. They just blunder around and yeah. they eat fruit. But I mean, yeah. still. Hey, that sounds just like me, actually. <laughs> Just kind of wander around eating fruit. I just, I just hope want to be don't find you with your legs up in the air. <laughs> Put me in, coach. All right. No, so four hundred one ks are not magic, and this is the main vehicle that we use to replace pensions. By the way, yes, so yes. Like if, defined benefit pensions. Yeah, we don't do that anymore. Now we have four hundred one ks, and you can. It's like a freedom thing. Right. That was how it sold. You may. This is a thing that I can't convince people of. All these Republican ideologies, mm-hmm. these things they promote, you got to look at who they benefit and figure this out. I mean, it seems like such a basic thing that but everyone should understand this by now. But it's like, these aren't God-given Ten Commandments mm-hmm. In fundamental school, truths fundamental fact, truths ha- just handed, lies right. about how they're going to steal your money <laughs> yeah God loves you and has a glorious plan <laughs> to steal all your money and give it to Wall Street won't that be great yes so um, that's uh, so, what yeah. capitalism's become it's become More. a religion and it's kind of absurd so this one about how they're not magic is um, there's this talk about let's say bootstrap pulling financial personal finance advice Yes. And the idea is that all poor people really need to do in order to turn around their lives is be responsible with their money. Yep. Be thrifty, save, invest responsibly. And just to be clear, I'm not saying you shouldn't be thrifty or save. I Or try to be frugal. We have tried uh, many it's, times to, to do things like, you know what, we're just going to have whatever extra money we have, we're going to try and have it on expense 
experiences, spend it on experiences that the kids will remember and instead of stuff. older age instead of right. stuff. So no, and, and I really embrace the frugality thing and yeah. the minimalism. Of that. I'm not, I'm not trying to poo poo that. We right? say as we're surrounded by trappings of Bar upper stuff. middle class. <laughs> you know, actually, this is what we have left of the trappings yeah. of middle class life. Right. A lot of it we've tried to ditch. Right. Um, so I'm not exactly trying to just say that that's a bad idea. Yeah. It, but the it, reality it is... Takes, it takes people of middle class income to have hobbies. To have hobbies. To, to do well, projects and, other than at, at a level of survival. Right. And, and this is the point we're getting at here in this article, is that um, to be thrifty, to save, and to invest responsibly, you actually need enough money to do that. Yes. Like, either there's a certain amount of money below which that doesn't even make sense. There's a certain amount of, there's a certain income for every family or person below which any kind of economic security is illusory because right. the slightest shock to the system, the slightest unplanned expense, the slightest anything, anything. can get you evicted. Get you evicted, you lose your job. Yeah. But then you get evicted. I mean, it's not just a yeah, cascade. Cascade, failure. because there's no, there's no margin for error. Get and, up in jail. And newsflash: yeah. personal virtue will not save you from eviction. All of these job loss, any of these errors, jail, car breakdowns, because they're forced errors. You know, right, the forced errors. And uh, there was there was an article going around for a while. You know, you you need twenty years without anything going wrong to, re to really escape poverty and change financial levels like right. level up to where you're actually going to be financially secure for the rest of your life yeah you need 20 years with no nothing goes wrong with nothing going wrong no one gets sick your car doesn't break down i mean like nothing happens i've had 14 jobs since college as an <laughs> I've, example i've lost jobs Five, six times. Right. And, I'm, and this, is, uh, this is going well. These are things going well. These are things going well. And I'm a good, productive employee, right? I'm not a marginal person with a minimal set of skills, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> so, really, it's, it's, a, it's a losing proposition no matter how you stack it. Yes. So, all of this advice, really, about scrimping, saving, being thrifty, ignores math, the basic math fact that no matter how much you scrimp and save and invest wisely will not save you if you don't have enough money in the first place. Yeah. So if you're a low wage earner who cut your expenses <clears throat> to the bone, so you can save $500 a year and then you earn 8%, you will still not go more than a year in retirement without starving to death. You're not, right. you're not going to get ahead doing right. that. And here's the, what's this study here? Okay. So the study found that, um, so we're going to hire these people and we're going to auto enroll them. In 401 k plans. This is just going to be the, the thing we That's do now, and it's uh, we're doing them a favor. Doing them a favor, because then they'll save more money that way, They're, rather than leaving it up to them to enroll. We're helping them with their uh, Personal old responsibility. age. Their old yeah. age. It's good. It's good. It's virtuous. All right. Look at that. Win-win. Win-win. Company, Companies being virtuous. The study found that four years after hire, the employees who were auto-enrolled amassed an average of... Three thousand two hundred thirty-seven dollars more in four hundred one k contributions than those who were left. Or to set not, up their own. who had to set it up themselves. Right. Had the option, but it wasn't like just done for them. Right now, that number includes employee <clears throat> and employer contributions, but not any market growth. Yeah, or losses. Right, but they don't talk about losses. No, we never talk about losses. Yeah, past performance is in our prediction of future <laughs> results. That's in the fine print, but it should be the headline. The headline. But the auto-enrolled employees also had an average of $1,563 more in consumer and auto debt yep. than those who were hired before auto-enrollment. Yep. When mortgage debt is factored in, the picture becomes even more complicated. The auto-enrolled employees owed $4,131 more, on average, on their homes than their colleagues who were hired before auto-enrollment. Mm-hmm. So the debt more than offsets the extra three thousand two hundred seventy three dollars the auto enrolled auto enrolled employees had. So yeah. auto enrolling actually just took away their money and they had to replace it with debt. Yes. And And the debt is gonna cost because, them more than they're gonna the earn. interest rate on debt I mean to break it down just a little because the interest rate on most 
debt that an average consumer has access to is far higher than the rate of return, return. I mean, against a 401k. I, but even if they were, let's say, even if they were the same, right, it would be it'd be basically breaking even by having you. debt, right? <laughs> so, and, and the way compound interest works, even if the, the debt, it was, you know, a, a fraction of the, like the interest rate of your debt was a fraction of the rate of return of the 401k. Right. The, because of the way compound interest works, you're, it's you're totally killing closed. a huge, if you draw it out as a curve, you're killing a huge area, you know, a huge volume yeah, of money. money. It's just going yeah. away. It's, it's evaporating. Yeah. Right. Um, so in short, so same, found- same thing, the way a, a load you know, the difference between your load, like, oh, 1% load on your fund doesn't sound like much. It's yeah, huge. huge over 25, 25 years. 25 years, right. And or more. You never, you don't quite see it. You just, no. You just never have it. No, even the difference of a quarter percent can be huge. Right. So while people, while these people put away more for retirement, those savings were more than canceled out by increased debt. Um, yeah. So you can't force people to save money they don't have enough money to begin with. Yep. Or you can't force people to save money they don't have. And the real thing about this whole 401k thing. The financialization of everything. Of everything. Is it's it's a casino and the house always wins. Yeah. It's well, again, you're putting an individual up against capitalism. Against capitalism. Like, here you and, go. Good luck. Yeah. And a few people do well. Right. But, no, and that's the thing. At the casino, uh, a few people have to do well. Right. To, to make it look like to make it look like you maybe you could win one day it look like you could win so yeah. you keep coming back yeah. and you know playing the slots or whatever it is yeah so, so some, someone will win all right there will be winners but not many so and, and i mean i've had 403bs and 401ks and i have one now mm-hmm. and i am putting money into it and i'm even getting an employer match now yeah but it's not I think we might have enough to take a big vacation when you retire. It's not substantial. No. And um, the, I, well, last job I had at the University of Michigan, I was at that job for, I believe, six years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I contributed to the 403B the whole time. And there was a big, I forget what years, but it was like 96 to 99 Right. There was a big recession going on yeah. in the markets. Some big losses. And so that like 7% annualized rate of return that was supposed to happen turned into a net loss. Yeah, that didn't happen. And, you know, since then, the the trend of that money that I invested then has been upwards. Yeah. But... You can't make up. That's the thing with with um, compound interest over long periods of time. You can't make up those losses. The, without... ear, the early loss with later gains. It doesn't work. Right. Because it needs to be. It needs to be, work. It needs to be there early to make to make gains. Right. Right? And so that was that was a large portion of the retirement that I have is right. is going to be a fraction of what it had been if those investments had returned what was expected and normal right um, meanwhile i've had since then i've had two or three other 401ks and twice i've had to just cash out 401ks to keep going usually at the end of being unemployed for for f- four or five months mm-hmm. so that's not you know that's not been helpful and i have one now it's an accumulating what sounds like you know a reasonable amount of money but look at where it's going to go Against inflation sure. and against and everything else, right? Yeah. Everything. Well, like I said, it it leaves you with enough <clears throat> at sixty five to take a nice vacation <laughs> and then kill yourself. Uh, yeah, I mean, is so that, is that the plan? That's the plan. I'm going to go to uh, you know, we're going to go to Iceland and Acapulco. We're going to have a lovely dinner out together, go dancing, Yay! you know, and then have I'm our just, honeymoon. Uh, we're going to finally have our honeymoon. That'd be good. And then I'm just going to shoot myself in the head. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds horrible. What are you talking about? And then you can, you can cash out the life insurance. No, see, if no. you say that, now we can never do oh, that. So. Thanks a lot, Paul. Folks, this is not actually my plan. I'm just <laughs> saying. Like, what no, else do you want to with, right? Liter- literally, like, it's not actually my plan. But I remember this this planning session with this financial guy that sold us the, our previous life insurance policy. Right, right, Where we were trying to plot out, okay, so what does your retirement look like? And we plotted out a couple graphs for, you know, like... 
what it was going to look like if we put so and so much in a month. And it was just it was absurd. grim. It was yeah. It, it, the thing is, it was grim even with the optimistic seven percent. The most optimistic return. Settings were grim. It was still grim. Right, and that was ten and years so ago. And so what we did is like or well, 12. and I had said yeah, let's. I'm going to plan to die at ninety five. Right. How about that? Uh, so and like so we did this all and he's like well you're going to be living on you know next to <laughs> next to nothing next to nothing from you know between the ages of i don't know 70 and 95 and by the time you're 95 you'll be scraping gum off the sidewalk or something, or something. I, don't know. I don't know but it's like well why don't you know to make these numbers work why don't we just uh assume you're gonna die at 70. 75 instead it's like okay fine oh but, look it all works <laughs> And you had to work till you're seventy. <laughs> so, so it's, the the well, numbers the, don't work. The numbers, the numbers don't, don't work. work, and the the whole the thing with they don't work for various reasons. But this specific article was that uh, the that it links to this article links to a study. This, mm-hmm. The the whole as if we haven't hammered it into the ground enough here. Mm-hmm. The whole point is that auto enrolling people helps, but it doesn't help actually with their money problem. situation which is they're not earning enough. enough full stop that's it and that's the problem. they're not really earning enough to do the kind of retirement savings that's going to help them they're losing money because their debts are outstripping their retirement savings precisely but even if let's say everyone was making a reasonable salary okay sure i'm thinking of my and this is my friend was a boomer yeah well, he's a boomer she's still yeah. alive um she worked as a psychotherapist for about 30 years, retired like in 2007. And all Diligently her, put money into the system. 401k. Put in a system 401k for decades. And then uh, a year after she retired, um, everything blew up in the 2008 recession. Mm-hmm. And so what she was like going to live on like $50,000 a year or something. And uh, yeah. And... After everything was, um, um, you know, which is a modest. It's modest, depending right. on where you live. Right, and she, you know, her house was paid off. Yeah, you know? if your house paid off, that's quite a decent income, right. and, depending and on where you live. Done but. the planning, right? So her house is paid off. All this, uh, if you have health insurance, right, yeah. right, and she didn't have health insurance. She's gonna have to buy health insurance, etc. Oh yeah, trying to buy health insurance Bless for yourself <laughs> right. in in your old age. Yeah, right. so good luck with that. Got Medicare, Medicare. Yeah. And was going to try and purchase other like complimentary insurance, all these other things, right? Um, so the, the yeah, because Medicare will take your house. Yeah, that's the other thing. Medicare takes your house right. after you're dead, though. You're not using your house anymore. Just take it. Yeah. So is that gonna all be a right. problem? Um, all her gains evaporated in 2008 crash. Yep. So now she's got like fifteen thousand dollars a year to live on. Yep. So a year after her retirement, she went and got a real estate license and started selling houses. So she could stay in hers. Um, yeah, and she's fortunate because she's got yeah, skills. And, right, and she's and, fortunate. Yeah, yeah. She was lucky, and that this is this, so. No, this whole yeah. plan. Well, you saw this happen with pensions too, legally, right. where pension funds were raided by raided. companies like of the type that um, Bain Capital used to eviscerate and eat the pensions. Right, yeah. and that's so. This is. And that those are those were protections that were stripped yep. from pensions, right? And protections that don't exist for four hundred one ks that your right. your retirement money can evaporate even after you've earned it, even after you've put it away, you've done all the right things, right. and you can still be in the lurch, yeah, working at seventy seventy five, and you're lucky if you still can, yeah, right. Um, there's actually a fair amount of research that says that you're really not good for the workforce after about 45 <laughs> <laughs> wait, 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 wait. and this is not to say people are, like are, are um, useless useless but just that um the way we understand workforces no. right <laughs> yeah no i i should i mean I'm, I'm can be very productive i've been actually surprised myself sometimes with how productive i can be as a software engineer at 50 mm-hmm. but i should be mentoring people Yes. And teaching uh, my replacements, you know. Yeah, yeah. And there should be a mechanism for you to do that. And then, you know, what is it? What they have in the in the Southeast Asian culture, like a, your third career, your third third career, right? Or third, yeah. Your third life is what it's called. Right? <laughs> um, and we we don't even have like a mechanism or structure for for one life. No. 
but yeah. So that this is social, uh, really social, social uh, structure. Structure. Yeah. Um, and one of these articles talks about how you know we we really need to be um, talking about um, uh, wealth redistribution, right? Mm-hmm. And this is the thing I I really I can't bring it to people enough. I can't say this too many times. We already redistribute wealth. Yeah, it just goes in one direction. It just goes in one direction, away yeah. from most of us to a small minority of us. Yep. We're already redistributing wealth. It's not like some taboo that we, we are afraid of as a society. Right. Right. It's what we do, is we redistribute yeah. wealth. Yep. So all I'm saying is that we should redistribute the wealth in a fair way. Mm-hmm. Honestly, I mean, that's yeah. all I'm saying, you know, so that yeah. everyone has, has an equal, has uh, not... not uh, not equality, but equity. But does everyone has to wear equity in society? Um, that's that's a topic I, we should come back to in a later show. Is what it means to have um, this. This is part of the whole red Tory thing. Oh yeah, where you, yeah. you it doesn't work to just give people income. You just give them cash. You, know. you need to give them assets. Right. Yeah. yeah, and I want everyone to have the means of production. That's 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 my flag. That, that was another topic we were <laughs> oh, <it was> great. <laughs> talking about today. Okay, there is a third one article. One last article. Yeah. And this one is um, uh, Fuck My Life. <laughs> FML. Uh, that's what that stands for, right? Do yes. I understand that? Yes. Okay. Um, and it's uh, Why Millennials Are Facing the Scariest Financial Future of Any Generation Since the Great Depression by Michael Hobbs. Steve yeah. Hobbs. <laughs> He's he's explaining why life is nasty, brutish, and short. Yes, he is. Um, this is a this is a solid article. It's I'm going to say a monograph. It, it's on the if a you brief, look at it online, monograph. it's like this. As you scroll through it, it's one of these articles where there are pictures Does that scroll and it just go like it's animating stuff it's and it goes. Going, going. It's a big like multimedia experience online. Right. And if you go if you just go to print that, it says it told me. This is going to be 45 pages. Do you want <laughs> like, that? No, I don't even have enough paper, paper left. If I, so um, I I like, th- there is a button you can find somewhere on this page that says text only text version. Only. Right. That's still, <laughs> still what, still 10 still pages, long. 15 pages? Uh, so this is this uh, is a monograph. D- double, I recommend. Double, double sided, two pages, t- two up on the right. page to try and get it down but so i'd like folks to read this and yes. I'd like so we can like have a, a more interactive a colloquium right a little colloquium about this maybe we could invite people to facebook in or something i don't know this this article really lays out a lot of the the actual research the economic details the the uh, uh like it says i mean it says it does what it says on the tin it explains why and he it's talks about fun. the history of housing the history of you know mm-hmm. All of these things that millennials are having trouble with, right? You know, the cost of, right. and why this is happening and how it's happening. So it's a good piece. I mean, but um, yeah. it's not. Uh, I don't, we're not going to go through it, you know, chapter right. by chapter today. But now I'm just going to point out this one thing sure. that I feel like people. Some I, I hope you, everyone listening knows this already, but maybe others don't, and maybe you started listening. Yeah. Um, Hours of minimum wage work needed to pay for four years of public college. Oh, my God. For boomers, it was 306 hours. Yeah. Millennials would need to work 4,459 hours to do the same. I still hear people... uh, You know, I go to... Sometimes I go out to breakfast at... That's an order of magnitude, just to be clear. Yeah. I I, I go out to breakfast at the... um, the Harvest Moon. Uh, Harvest Moon Cafe up the street. Mm-hmm. And I still hear people just chatting, older people, right. older than me, right. um, just chatting about how, oh, I just worked minimum wage in college and I paid for everything. Yeah. Like, they Dude. they have this idea Dude. that that's possible. Dude. It's, I, it's crazy. How much could a banana cost? $10? <laughs> It's it's a yeah. People do not understand all the ways that the economic world has changed, and it's like the Utah the phrase uh, you know Utah Phillips Utah Phillips yeah his his famous phrase is the the people are you know the earth isn't just dying people are killing it and they and have addresses the people that are killing it have names and addresses this stuff says, you know the millennials aren't just failing they're 
you know, the, the first article. They're they're being killed. They're, they're being, being killed. Right. their life energy is being sucked sucked, down, sucked, sucked, sucked out dry. of them. The people that are doing that, the people that have organized this, have names and addresses. Right. So this is this is like the the theme we want to we want to run with for a few shows and maybe. Oh, we want to come back to this again and again <clears> this year. I think this is the year of like figuring this out. Figuring it out. We want to we want to involve millennials in this discussion, and we want to talk about what radical uh, economics looks like and what right. protest looks like. Right. For what can be done. For what can be done. Yeah, yeah. So so we'd like to we'd like to hear from any millennials listening. If you have friends that would maybe like to call in or participate and maybe have engage this conversation with us throughout the course of this year, we'd love to hear from you. One of the things I've been putting time into down here in the basement. Mm-hmm. over Christmas and New Year was setting up s- some extra hardware um, by which I mean I go to music around and scrounge through their piles of dented and <laughs> used stuff looking for something that might possibly work right. with my old computer and audio interface and all this to somehow uh, get us good sound quality while we right. um, for supporting like uh, Skype calls and like a Google Hangout or something. Right. And we haven't quite finished testing it. Uh, I'm not positive that it'll work very well, but I'm positive I can get audio out of it and record it along with our local voice. And it sound it'll sound basically as as good as it can. As it can. Which it together. and Skype doesn't sound very good. I've discovered. You know, you may be the only person that notices. <laughs> People notice. Okay, People but, complain yeah. about Skype. But Google Hangouts may be better. We'll have to experiment. So Let's we're going to try and do some experiments. Right. But the the upshot is we're getting ourselves set up so that we can bring in guests remotely. Right. And we, we really want to – we just don't want to sit here about a couple of old people pontificating about what you need to do with your no, life. No, we're not really – I mean, I want to point out the problem and talk about, you know, raise awareness of this problem. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I'm 50 – I'm one of the the vampire squids. Yeah, you know, I mean, Sometimes. I don't intend to be, but yeah, if is. I collect Social Security one day, I'm going to be sucking off the lifeblood of millennial labor. Um, yeah. But we want to want to hear your. We want to hear from some young people and hear their ideas and ideas. Hear what works. And yeah. we want to talk about some of these forbidden socialist ideas. Forbidden socialist ideas, and I talk, want to talk about, about some of my. Why are we so f- afraid of radical solutions? Right. And my, some of my nut job alternative retirement ideas. Nut job, alternative retirement ideas, communal living ideas, all that stuff. Uh, communal financial ideas, um, mm-hmm. mutual aid, and basically, what did people do in the depression that worked? So many things. Yeah. A lot. So and many things. They they're all, work. all of those things are ideologically they're completely outside the Overton window, window between Democrat and Absolutely. Republican. And they're completely outside completely that. Completely outside. But these were things that people did to retire. They're, you know, they're more than the standard deviation of life in the Overton window. Actually. Absolutely. Yeah. And they're they're not radical. No. They're actually not radical. They're practical. Right. Just practical, so, basic. Yeah. Get into the winter. All righty. That's that. I think we're going to wind up. So, yeah, I'm, I'm excited about this, this possibilities for the for 2018. Me too. Yeah. All right. See you <laughs> okay. next week, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.